commenced our research program since 2018. Uh, I'm sure that the first question that pops into everyone's mind is what kind of research do we do? Um, and at Temple Israel, uh, our primary research mission is to document the over 1,100 Jews uh, that helped to found and develop Leadville from its early days as a mining camp in the 1860s and 70s through the emergence of Leadville as a modern cosmopolitan city during the uh, boom years of the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, and the Jewish community and, and Leadville's community at largest decline uh, during the 1920s and into the 1930s. So today, although we do have occasional services a few times a year, we function primarily as a research institution and museum, and we have a small staff of historians uh, who research and document Leadville's pioneer Jews. Uh, we publish these biographical histories on our website at jewishleadville.org, and uh, I would encourage anyone who has further interest in learning about uh, the Jewish people uh, who were here uh, to, to look over their stories. They're very interesting. Um, as far as the foundation and museum, we're ordinarily open to the public year round daily from May through October and by appointment the rest of the year. However, uh, with the uh, current conditions created by the uh, pandemic, we, we open late this summer, but we have managed to remain open. And we have limited winter hours this year, Friday through Monday. Uh, 10.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, there's no admission fee and we're the second most visited museum in Leadville. Um, there's a significant number of our visitors who come from across the continent and across the globe and there are Jewish travelers who come to Leadville with the specific intent of visiting the synagogue. Uh, I would like to also say that although we have a significant number of Jewish visitors, we are not a religious institution. Um, and we have a substantial number of secular visitors who find us by surprise or through curiosity and are generally pleased uh, that they did. So this is, uh, these photos are of the building around 1894 and, and this is what the synagogue looked like about 10 years after it was built, uh, after they had added electric light and carpeting. The structure was completed in about a month in August and September of 1884. Um, today, we're going to be discussing the Jewish pioneers of Leadville and the synagogue they built in 1884, which now houses our museum. A uh, brief history of that building, it was built during the summer of 1884 and operated as a meeting place for Leadville's Jewish reform community from that time until the late 1920s. The day-to-day -day function of the building as a synagogue likely ended with the funeral of Ozio Zeiler on November 1st, 1912, but it's last listed in the city directory in 1914. We do know that the synagogue operated for special events and personal worship until around 1927, but its, it's everyday functionality um, seems to have concluded um, around World War I. Um, the land for the synagogue was donated to David May, uh, founder of the May Company, uh, department store change by Horace Tabor for the benefit of Leadville's Jewish reform community in 1880. So the land for the synagogue was donated to uh, David May by Horace Tabor uh, for the benefit of the uh, reform uh, community in 1884. So between 1937 and 2006, this building was repurposed several times over by various enterprises. In 1937, it was acquired by Steve Mallon, who operated the building as an op automobile repair shop. Um, and uh, he and his family also lived in the building. Um, during World War II, it served as a dormitory for local miners. Uh, for a time, uh, it became a vicarage for St. George's Episcopal Church across the street. Um, and from 1966 until 2006, it operated as a multi-unit apartment building. Um, so the building and the Hebrew Cemetery were acquired by Temple Israel Foundation in 1992. Um, the intent was always to uh, restore them to their historic grandeur. An electrical fire in 2006 in the back of the building caused some pretty heavy damage. And at that point, rather than return it uh, back to its residential state, there was an opportunity to begin the interior restoration work 
uh, and with some substantial help from the Colorado Historical Society, the synagogue was completely restored to its original condition. We opened the museum in 2008. Um, th these photographs are kind of interesting. Um, there was uh, some overturned headstones here on the left um, after uh, vandalism. And the other photo of this is of some unknown volunteers um, that, that tried to clean the cemetery up in, in 1975. Um, the, the 75 photo really demonstrates uh, how the forest reclaimed um, the necropolis over the years before the foundation uh, took to restoring it. And uh, with the current social climate, we should also, while we're sort of talking about this vandalism, touch on uh, the ethnic questions surrounding the Jewish community and other ethnic groups that were present in Leadville during the boom era. And note that there isn't really a lot of evidence of racial inequity among Leadvillians during this time. It's not to say that the newspapers didn't react to ethnicity. Um, they, uh, the West generally people needed each other and tended to get along. Um, newspapers do kind of, uh, with some regularity, um, mention ethnicity for what appears to be purposes of identification, and sometimes that's unflattering um, when you know there was a crime committed within a certain ethnic group or you know a recent uh, Indian uprising. Um, but uh, generally, we have no acts of anti-Semitism or racially motivated crimes that uh, have been recorded in Leadville. Recent discoveries um, informed us that uh, the Jewish community were victims of vandals two times over the course of about 140 years. But these actions, um, one of these incidents in 1909 where three boys were caught throwing rocks at the synagogue, and claimed they were just trying to frighten the custodian. Um, one of these boys was completely exonerated. Another was convicted but not sentenced because his employer vouched for him. And then there was a third boy, um, a 12-year-old named Willie Ferry, uh, who was sentenced to the state reformatory in Golden um, over that incident. The second incident, which was around 1970, um, after the <clears throat> forest had been or the uh, cemetery had been in disrepair it was just sort of an act of random viol uh, vandalism and although some tombstones were knocked over there's no real evidence to suggest that this was anything more um, than random act from rambunctious teenagers so um, it's just a kind of a point I like to make with all the uh, stuff that's been going on lately um, most of you might be surprised to find out that Leadville ever had substantial uh, Jewish community. This wasn't uncommon in Western mining towns at all. Most of the Jews that came West during the mining boom era were recent immigrants from Northern Europe and Russia. Uh, the population centers of the U.S. at this time provided little business opportunity for immigrants. And so when you came to the States, you either took menial jobs or looked for opportunities where there was the greatest growth and that was in the American West. Um, most of our Jewish immigrants were merchants and peddlers who followed the mining camps. Mining itself uh, is high risk, but selling goods and services to miners uh, was safer and more profitable. Uh, in fact, you see a good deal of evidence of Jewish communities in mining camps. Uh, Saul Starr uh, was a German Jewish immigrant. He came to the United States at the age of 10 years old. Uh, left Ohio for the mining boom in Helena, Montana, where he was uh, the territorial auditor and personal secretary to the governor. Uh, he then moved on in 1876 to open up a hardware store in Deadwood, uh, and there he became very active in politics. He served on the town council. He was a postmaster, uh, was the mayor of Deadwood from 1884 until 1898. Uh, there's a Jewish cemetery at Boot Hill in Tombstone, uh, Arizona, and another historic synagogue that operates as a museum in Tucson. Um, Jewish gambler and gunfighter Jim Levy passed through Leadville on his continued tour of Western mining camps after a deadly encounter in Cheyenne, Wyoming during 1877 that had his, him solidify his reputation. And uh, he also narrowly escaped a murder charge and fell under public scrutiny at that point. 
Jeffrey, a question, I think you touched on this, came in. I'm curious about the Jewish population at its peak. Did they ever have a large enough amount of Jews to fill the pews? Well, we're going to touch on that coming up here in a minute. Um, there, the, the, the quick answer to that was the Jewish community was rather large here. Um, they did have enough to fill the pews, and they also had enough to open a second synagogue. There was an Orthodox synagogue here as well, and I'm coming up to that right now. Um, so thanks for your question, Naomi. Um, this here is a, a photo of Knesset Israel Orthodox Synagogue. Um, Temple Israel was uh, intended for use by Leadville's Reform Jewish congregation. There was also a significant number of Orthodox Jews in Leadville, and they had their own congregation. Um, they had philosophical division from the Reform movement, of course, and there was an increased separation between the two groups that continued to develop between 1884 and 1892. Most of that separation hinged on interpretations of religious philosophy, um, things like burial rites, uh, the reform congregation's progressive attitude that didn't require them to segregate sexes, um, and the reform congregation's inclusion of music during the services. So there are many things these two groups didn't agree on, and this created a schism. We don't really know solid numbers on the Orthodox community, but we do know it was much smaller than the reform, probably never exceeded 40 members. Uh, some of the Orthodox Jews were likely so resolved in their Position that they may never have set foot in this building. Um, in 1892, an official Orthodox congregation was established to, as Knesset Israel, and in November, they purchased the old Presbyterian church that you see here um, on Fifth Street, where Leadville's Elks Club uh, now sits. That synagogue opened in 1893 and likely operated a bit longer than Temple Israel. Uh, we show an event held there in 1934 but it likely ceased to function as a regular house of worship sometime between 1925 and 1927. And the building itself was torn down in 1937 uh, when the BPOE took over the property. And Jews were significant in helping uh, establish communities throughout the American West. Now there's an interesting phenomenon where Leadville's concern regarding population numbers. Um, Leadville was particularly be attractive to Jewish pioneers. In fact, um, th th throughout history, since Leadville incorporated as a city in 1878, the population, uh, the Orthodox community topped out at 40. The, the uh, Leadville Jewish community at large, both Reform and um, uh, Orthodox, uh, there's an interesting phenomenon there where, where uh, Leadville appeared to be pre pretty uh, hospitable um, to Jewish uh, pioneers. Um, and so throughout history, since Leadville was incorporated as a city in 1878, the, the population has remained rather consistent here. And at about 1% of the population right, ratio has, has been pretty consistently Jewish uh, over the years. Currently, the national population of Jews is about 1.8% on average, but prior to World War II, it was roughly a half a percent of the population at large. It means Leadville was 1% uh, Jewish population was about twice the national average per capita. It put Leadville on par with Jewish population centers like New York City and Cincinnati. So at Leadville's peak population in the mid 1880s, the, uh, the general population here uh, topped out at about 30,000. Um, and so three to 400 of those uh, were Jewish. And so today, Lake County contains a total population of around 10,000. They estimate still 100 of those people are probably Jewish. Um, there's no Jewish community left in Leadville, unfortunately, and I would wager that not all of them even know that this uh, institution ever existed. Uh, but still, that population figure remains about 1%. And yes, Saul Starr was also a character in the HBO uh, television series, uh, Deadwood, although I got to tell you that story, that uh, 
that show had a lot of historic problems, <laughs> including uh, how they portrayed Seth Bullock and Saul Star. Um, so the earliest uh, recorded Jewish person in Colorado was Solomon Carvalho. And he was a Sephardic Jew who was an accomplished artist and Daraga type uh, photographer who came to Leadville uh, or came to Colorado with uh, John Fremont's fifth expedition in 1854 and, and passed through the valley where Leadville sits today. Um, less than a decade later after that, uh, gold was discovered in California Gulch in 1860 and this began the mass uh, migration uh, into this region. And so the first recorded Jewish settlers uh, in the Leadville area were Wolf Londoner, who operated a grocery and mining supplies. And Simon Zethan originally came to the area to mine and was successful. This wasn't typical. Um, the Jews rarely engaged directly in the mining industry and tended to open businesses in support of miners and mining. Uh, and often instead, uh, they invested in mining or, or sat on mining regulatory boards, but few, uh, few actually operated mines themselves. The concept of retail operation was uh, a much safer bet economically, and, and that tend to, tends to be what we see as more merchants and settlers, uh, merchants and peddlers coming into the area. So Londoner was a retailer who came to Leadville during the initial gold rush in 1860 and one of the area's first residents. He settled in California Gulch and began operating a grocery store that catered to miners. Uh, Londoner was important to the development of the mining camp into what became the city of Leadville. As one of the early residents, he hosted uh, a visit from Colorado Territorial Governor William Gilpin in the early 1860s. In 1879, uh, Wolf passed his Leadville operations on to his brother Julius and moved to Denver where he married Fanny Anthony and continued his retail opportunities. A foray into politics would have him win the Denver mayoral election in 1888. However, uh, his opponents filed a suit and he was found guilty of voter fraud. He was asked to vacate the office and he refused. The court case played out with an unsuccessful appeal to the Colorado Supreme Court and Londoner was forced to step down from his office in 1891. Now during 1876 and 1877, as a result of the silver, silver boom, there is a massive influx of Jewish settlers that came into the area for their own opportunities. And so by 1879, there's enough Jewish residents in Leadville that we start to see an emergence of Jewish organizations and evidence of a developing reform congregation. This increase in the Jewish population began to raise concerns for the need of these organizations. Most significant of these were the Hebrew Ladies Relief Society and the Rocky Mountain uh, Lodge Number 322, the Independent Order of B'nai B'rith uh, was chartered in November of 1879. Um, so these organizations um, would quickly be replaced by others, but the significance here is that the death of Gustav Jelenko, uh, who was a Jewish businessman, um, he and his brother Fred were merchants and operated several retail enterprises in Leadville and Kokomo, which was a satellite community located near the top of Fremont Pass. Um, Gustav died at Kokomo during July of 1879 from an accidental over morphine overdose that he was taking for uh, neuralgia. And this created an immediate concern that uh, there was a need for a Hebrew cemetery in Leadville. And so in January of 1880, um, the Hebrew Relief Society acquired 101,000 square feet of Evergreen Cemetery for use uh, by the Jewish community. And in the spring, Gustav Jelenko became the first resident of Leadville's Hebrew Cemetery. Now the cemetery was used with regularity into the 1920s and then it fell into quiet. Um, Temple Israel uh, Foundation acquired the property in 1992 and it's now fully restored. Um, and again, it is, uh, there's a section uh, that we now use for modern burials. And so between 1879 and 1884, the Jewish community in Leadville grew substantially. And during uh, this time, we see evidence of an emerging congregation 
uh, two of them, the Orthodox and Reformed Jews, they're meeting in private homes and storefronts. The first known synagogue in Leadville was actually in the Schoenberg Opera House on East Chestnut Street, and that was a building owned by Moses Schoenberg, whose family operated several successful clothing operations in town from 1879 to 1889. In fact, uh, by the time Temple Israel opened in 1884, there were somewhere between three and 400 Jews in Leadville, not all of them uh, religious and not all of them reform, but we do know that the building, uh, the night the building was dedicated uh, on Rosh Hashanah on September 19th, 1884, there were 170 uh, reform congregants in this uh, in this building in, in attendance that night. So there were certainly enough uh, to fill the capacity of this building um, and then some. So the last time I did this presentation, I took a little I took a little criticism for not giving enough attention to uh, this particular story, but the reality is that we have so many interesting stories uh, from the past to share uh, in these presentations, it's really hard to pick them. Um, but uh, in 1878, there was a Polish Jewish immigrant, uh, Jacob Sandalowski, uh, who's otherwise known as Jake Sands, and he was a clothing merchant uh, operating a store in Central City. He met um, then named Elizabeth Doe, while she was still married to her first husband, Harvey, and the two became romantically involved. And Elizabeth had written about one of these uh, romantic interludes with Jake um, in her scrapbook, and, and this likely tipped Harvey Doe off to Elizabeth's impropriety. And the long and the short of this is that uh, that Jake impregnated Elizabeth, um, and it's resulted in her divorce from Harvey. And uh, she gave birth to a stillborn baby in Denver in July of 1879. Shortly after that, Jake moved his business operations up to Leadville, and he opened a store in the ground floor of the Tabor Opera House. And um, in 1880, Elizabeth moved up here uh, with the intent to marry Jake. Um, and she began working in his store. And so his proximity to Horace Tabor, who was Jake's landlord, more than likely facilitated Elizabeth's introduction to Horace, and that would spur Horace's divorce from his first wife, Augusta, and subsequently uh, he would marry Elizabeth in this September of 1882. And despite Jake being jilted, uh, he and Elizabeth actually remained close uh, friends until his death at Bisbee, Arizona in, in 1917. So there were also some more famous historical Jews in Leadville that were important to the Jewish history here and, and the community at large. Um, Meyer Guggenheim of the Pennsylvania Guggenheims and the New York uh, Museums um, brought their first mines uh, in Leadville and they bought the AY and Mini Mines. The family had accumulated a small amount of wealth in lace manufacturing prior to this, and Meyer, uh, the patriarch of the family, came to Leadville looking for a mining venture. And so um, Meyer purchased uh, these two mines, the AY and Mini Mines. Um, they had groundwater problems, and Meyer had the necessary revenue uh, enabling him to get these pumped out. And when he did, he found substantial veins of silver uh, in the bottom of these two shafts. He then returned to Pennsylvania to explain to his sons that he had invested in mining. Um, they were reluctant to pursue uh, such a risky investment, but eventually they capitulated. And so the entire Guggenheim empire really jumps off in Leadville and um, they would soon purchase the Arkansas Valley smelter and they went into refining. And from there, they, they jumped off from here to Pueblo and then Mexico and South America. And this becomes one of the more successful mining ventures uh, and refining enterprises in the world. And uh, so as far as the family's Colorado operations, aside from Meyer, uh, the Benjamin and Simon Guggenheim were the most closely related to the operations uh, of the family business here. Now, Simon uh, served as a U.S. Senator representing Colorado from 1907 to 1913, 
Benjamin was also quite involved in operations and he would actually perish on the uh, Titanic in 1912. So more directly related to the synagogue, um, David May of the May Company began his department store empire in, in Leadville. Um, May was a Jewish Bavarian immigrant. He came to the United States and arrived at Ellis Island in 1865 at the age of 17. And from there, he moved on to, uh, to Cincinnati, where he worked for his uncle's clothing manufacturing. So May came to Leadville in 1878. Um, he was an asthmatic, and he felt the dry climate and altitude would help soothe this, um, as was sort of a popular uh, thought uh, at that time. So May had amassed a grub stake working for a clothing retailer in Indiana. Um, and he cashed out his interests in those business and he came west in 1878 and visited various resorts uh, looking for a new home and probably some adventure. Um, he fell in love with Leadville and decided that the physical labor required of mining, the high altitude and the dry climate would be good for his health. He was, frankly, uh, not good at mining. He uh, spent the summer of 1878 working his claim with his partners, Jake Holcomb and T.B. Dean. They pulled nothing of value from the ground, and then he decided to reestablish himself as a clothier, selling Levi's and long underwear from a tent on Harrison Avenue and Chestnut Street. Uh, his dedication to his partners is also demonstrated here. Uh, he brought several of them into the operation, the obelisk, that's pictured here on the uh, right is located at Harrison Avenue and 4th Street in Leadville. Um, this is one block east of the synagogue and it commemorates the location of May's first store here in Leadville. And so, as I mentioned before, May was instrumental to the development of Jewish life and the Leadville community at large. Um, he served as postmaster and a county treasurer. Um, he married Rosa, the daughter of Moses Schoenberg. Uh, one of his partners in September of 1880, and that tied those two families together. And in fact, we have evidence of the Schoenbergs in the employ of May, uh, the May Company well into the 20th century. Uh, as the Temple Israel Congregation became more established, May was elected vice president of the organization, <clears throat> and he was the custodian of the synagogue property, which was donated to him by Horace Tabor, uh, for the benefit of the congregation. May served as the head of the building committee. Uh, he had great responsibility for the building's construction, which spanned 33 days of August and September of 1884. And in 1888, shortly before May left Leadville to move his operations to Denver, uh, he transferred ownership of the property to the newly incorporated congregation Israel at that point. So uh, as I previously mentioned, May was a pretty loyal guy, um, securing uh, his in-laws connection with the enterprise in perpetuity, but he also uh, was quite loyal to his friends and in particular, Jake Holcomb, uh, who was originally one of May's mining partners. Uh, Holcomb continued to work for May as an accountant from the first rudimentary shop in Leadville until his death in Denver at, 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 uh, in 1925. So in 1952, a guy named Forbes Park Hill wrote a biography of May. Uh, and within it, Park Hill relayed a story about a May company efficiency expert who discussed Holson, uh, Holcomb's job performance with Dave in 1920. And I kind of want to share that exchange because I think it's kind of cool, but uh, it, it kind of demonstrates the kind of guy that David May was. Um, so, uh, so he's nearly 90 at this point. Point, and the expert points this out and about all he can do is draw his weekly paycheck. And so Dave May tilted back in his swivel chair, brown eyes staring at the ceiling as his thoughts raced back over the years. He was remembering Jake Holcomb, his mining partner, shoveling dirt into the bucket at the foot of the shaft, remembering Jake, his first partner in the muslin covered Leadville store, remembering him loyally staying with Dave May through good times and bad, through fires bank panics, and business depressions. Don't you think, May asked gently, with a faraway look still in his eyes, that for a man of nearly 90, drawing a paycheck in itself is quite an accomplishment. Needless to say, he did not uh, fire uh, Holcomb at this uh, 
experts uh, urging. Um, so the synagogue was dedicated during Rosh Hashanah uh, in 1884. And there was a visiting rabbinical student from Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati named Morris Sachs, uh, who conducted services that evening. And this is one of the few times that an actual rabbi directed services at Temple Israel. And this is an interesting point. It's important to note that neither Temple Israel or Knesset Israel congregation ever employed a full-time rabbi. Both of these congregations relied on cantors and laypersons to lead services. So rabbinical services here were rare and they're pretty well documented. So among the notable rabbis who did conduct services at Temple Israel, there was a Leadville native, Samuel Koch. Um, Samuel was born the son of a Leadville liquor merchant named Daniel Koch, who was well liked. Uh, he was also a pretty colorful uh, character within the Jewish community. Um, Daniel had more than one altercation with law enforcement and a reputation for winding up explaining himself to judges. Uh, in uh, November of 1881, after what was reported as five attempts uh, by a local constable to collect taxes, uh, the officer came to collect taxes again for a sixth time uh, or to shut down uh, Daniel's store. Uh, Koch became agitated and struck the constable uh, over the head with an unloaded gun. Um, constable Frazier then attempted to subdue Daniel when his wife, Sarah, came to his aid. He jumped on the constable's back. Uh, Frazier managed to defuse the situation, and in the aftermath, Daniel filed uh, charges against Frazier for assault and battery. Frazier filed a counter complaint against Daniel for resisting arrest and Justice McDowell listened to all of this and dismissed both of the charges. So despite his father's sometimes rambunctious behavior, Samuel grew up a dedicated student and he was a talented baseball player too. Um, in 1896, he were enrolled in the uh, rabbinical program at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. So between 1896 and 1902, he'd come back to Leadville uh, to conduct High Holy Day services. Uh, at Temple Israel. And upon his graduation in 1902, Rabbi Samuel Koch took over the fledgling Temple Hirsch to Sinai in Seattle, where he became quite accomplished. Uh, Samuel was a vocal anti-prohibitionist and he toured the country as an activist for that cause. He also established a Hebrew school, Seattle's public library, and was one of the founders of Seattle's Children's Hospital. Uh, he never forgot his Leadville roots. Uh, he would travel to officiate special uh, services and events for Temple Israel congregants, regardless of their current location. Um, and Samuel was extremely popular, uh, served his congregation until 1942, and many of his sermons and other documents are preserved in the uh, University of Washington archives. Jeff, you had a question. Did they have a Torah or Torahs? If so, what became of them? We, there were two Torahs. Um, there are, uh, essentially these left and went down to Temple Emmanuel in the 1930s. Um, we're not sure of the chain of custody on those things. We sort of suspect um, after doing a little research over the last couple of years that uh, the, uh, the, the Orthodox Torah is actually in Grand Junction now. Um, but uh, we have, we have uh, really no information on the original Torah that was here at Temple Israel. Um, we do have a Torah here. Uh, it was a donation. It's believed to be from 1900 Poland. Um, it has been restored. It's kosher. Uh, it does get used on occasion, um, but it's, it, it, it's not the original, but uh, being its uh, date of origin was probably a Holocaust rescue. So it's, it's probably got its own very interesting history connected to that. And like I said, it is kosher and it does get used on occasion. So moving on here, um, this brings us to another global historical dynamic, and that's the generation of Jewish pioneers that settled the American West. These people were immigrants. They were merchants and peddlers um, who found opportunity by selling things that people needed. And 
with the success they were able to uh, then send the next generation uh, uh, to on to college and, and to higher education and then we see a professional class that sort of begins to emerge around the turn of the 20th century. Um, and so local uh, Leadville grocer Isaac Kahn's son, Lee, grew up to become a, a Welsh respected physician who invented, uh, and I got to quote this here, a new aseptic applicator and injector consisting of an ordinary uh, uh, applicator made of virgin silver with an opening through its entire length and a graduated one drachm syringe to fit the handle. Uh, I would love to show you all a visual example of this, but we have yet to find any illustrations of it. Um, by the description, this was some time of type of a syringe reservoir designed to filter out bacteria and viral materials in the age prior to uh, uh, the existence of antibiotics decade before this, uh, decades before the discovery of penicillin in 1928. Uh, and so Dr. Lee Kahn uh, married a famous poetess and American Israelite newspaper correspondent Ruth Ward uh, in 1892, and she dedicated her first book, The First Quarter, to him um, in 1896. So another story that sort of demonstrates the idea of the first wave of Jews seeking opportunity uh, and then creating greater, uh, greater advantages for their children is that of the Robbie family. Um, Julius Robbie was a local confectioner, and he sent his son Max to the University of Michigan in 1904 where he studied dentistry. Max then returned to Leadville after he graduated um, in 1908 and he opened a dental practice above his father's store. So since then the Robbies have sent uh, at least one child from every generation to study dentistry at Michigan. John Robbie, uh, Max's great-grandson, uh, currently maintains the family's dental practice and that still operates uh, in, and is located in Denver. Jeffrey, I had a question that asked for the name of Ruth Ward's book. And do you yes. know her married name as well? Ruth Ward Kahn, K-A-H-N. And the name Which, of her book? The First Quarter. It's actually, I'll skip back here. This is an original copy of it. I'm, I, I, I don't believe it's still in print, but... Uh, if you hunt for it, you can find them. Um, so back to the Robbies, they're a really good example of a uh, Jewish legacy uh, that endured Colorado history from the early days into the 21st century, but they're also tied to one of our uh, greater scandals uh, in Temple Israel history. That uh, dates back to the 1890s. Ben Davies uh, was a local jewelry merchant, um, and he served as cantor to Temple Israel uh, beginning in 1883 until August of 1890. So he was the cantor for the congregation before the building was built. Um, at that time, it was discovered he was having an extramarital affair with Clementine Robbie, Julius Robbie's wife. Um, and so the succession of events uh, happened quite rapidly. Uh, gossip sort of started circulating uh, that Clementine and uh, Ben uh, Clementine had become sort of enamored with uh, Ben Davies' status as a jeweler. Um, it's evident that the affair became public around August 8th, 1890. Within days, uh, Julius Robbie sought a divorce from Clementine um, and that was granted on the grounds of uh, abandonment on August 14th. <clears throat> um, Clementine and Ben Davies uh, left Leadville at that point for Salt Lake City. They returned about a week later on August 19th as a married couple. Um, Clementine granted custody of the five Robbie children to Julius, um, and Ben was unceremoniously uh, stripped of his title as Temple Israel's uh, cantor at an emergency meeting on August 17th while he was still in Salt Lake City. Uh, the scandal kind of lost its steam rather quickly, and the, uh, the Davies couple uh, lived a quiet life for several years to follow this. Um, they welcomed two children, 
uh, Lillian in 1891 and Harry in 1892 um, to their newly developing family. Thanks, thanks for the comment, Mark. I, I appreciate that. Uh, it's, 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 what he invented is not really the syringe itself, though. It's some sort of filter that attaches to the syringe, so, um, which is you know, really what we're trying to figure out there. And hopefully we will at some point be able to provide some sort of illustration on it. But I've even looked uh, through patent records and can't find that. As interesting as it, as it is that the, you know, uh, Ben Davies and Clementine Robb, you had this affair and run off together. Um, that's just sort of part of the story. So uh, on August 7th, 1893, uh, there's a gas lamp that uh, exploded in Ben Davies store and it spread to neighboring structures. It was quite a big fire. Um, ben rushed back into his store to, to try and rescue some of the stock and he was overcome by the smoke and he died of asphyxiation. Um, so by September 28th, 1893, Clementine and Julius uh, Robbie had reconciled. Um, they had remarried and Julius adopted the two Davies children, Lillian and Harry, uh, and raised them as his own. So um, merchant pioneers, uh, pioneer Jews dominated liquor and tobacco distribution. Uh, saloons and pawn shops in Leadville um, during the boom area. And I already mentioned the uh, liquor merchant Daniel Koch and jeweler Ben Davies, but there were many others. Um, an example is Manny Hyman, uh, who owned the saloon where Doc Holliday had his last gunfight um, and coincidentally was disarmed barehanded by a Jewish deputy sheriff by the name of Henry Kellerman. Um, there was also Simon Hirsch and his brother Adolf. Uh, they operated a, a distillery and uh, a liquor distribution operation um, that was the first exec, uh, exclusive distributor of Anheuser-Busch products in Leadville. Uh, the company attained national success and survived prohibition um, by switching to patent medicine in 1919. Um, but Leadville Jews also had their hand in amusements uh, like gambling and prostitution as well. Uh, we know today that three of Leadville's 35 brothels were at one point controlled by Jewish proprietors. Um, Sam Levinsky uh, owned a place called the Owl Joint. He was probably the least respected of these proprietors. He was often running afoul uh, of law enforcement and uh, his com competitors around town. Newspapers described the Owl Joint as a night spot rife with violence and boasted lodging rooms, which he rents without asking questions. So um, also uh, Temple Israel President Joseph Monheimer was appointed executor uh, for the estate of a brothel owner, Molly May, not related to David May. Um, Monheimer operated that business, uh, her house of happiness, from April uh, of 1887 until it was sold at auction in September that same year. So this fella here is Ben Loeb. Um, and he's one of our, our favorite uh, characters here at Temple Israel. So he's a German born uh, pioneer and he arrived in Leadville from the Dallas area in 1881 and, and quickly became acquainted with the ins and outs of entertaining the miners. Uh, while he managed the Delmonico Health Hotel and Bar on Harrison Avenue. Um, and this initiated Loeb's rapid ascent from bartender to an entertainment mogul. And by 1890, Loeb owned three theaters in Leadville, the Carbonate, the Variety, and the Central Theater, uh, which immediately after its purchase was renamed Loeb's Palace of Pleasure, and it operated as a burlesque theater in a bordello. And so Loeb's uh, establishments were relatively upscale. Um, they featured a ladies entrance and they had public telephones. Um, Loeb also served as uh, the community as a promoter. And in 1889, he organized a vaudeville performance at City Hall that featured legless singer and dancer James E. Black and Rinalzo, the human corkscrew. Um, his establishments also often hosted boxing and wrestling events. For all of uh, Loeb's success, 
uh, his divorce in 1900 from wife Georgia Flynn coincided with a financial decline. And by the time he died in 1912, he was destitute. So uh, Loeb, and we preach, uh, previously mentioned uh, Sam Levinsky, they did not often see eye to eye. And on one occasion uh, in 1895, Levinsky raised Lowe's eyebrow after several uh, ladies employed at the Palace of Pleasure were found with their clients at uh, Levinsky's place. So we're, we're, we're moving on to wrapping up here, but to, you know, condensing these stories into an hour long presentation is, is a bit of a challenge. So to date, uh, our institution has researched and documented 251 Jewish surnames, eight Jewish organizations, a handful of regularly occurring social events, and identified uh, you know, 10 sort of major scandals that centered around the uh, Jewish community in Leadville. This list of uh, Leadville Jews is continually growing as we continue our research. This year alone, we've discovered um, over 60 new Jews uh, that we were previously unaware of. Um, and so this process is kind of uh, organic. The, the, the more we research, the more people we discover. Um, and uh, we, we just simply can't do more than scratch the surface on, on, on these kinds of presentations. So I would encourage everyone to visit our website at jewishleadville.org. Um, you can also find Temple Israel Leadville on Facebook, uh, where we profile one of these stories every Thursday. And please feel free to email me directly with any questions or discussions you'd like to continue at Jeffrey dot grant at snhu.edu. Uh, I would also encourage everyone to visit the museum in Leadville on uh, travel permits. Our docents are very well versed in the history uh, and all of us have different opinions. Um, we have our favorites and families that we can provide more detailed discussions on depending on our uh, individual fam familiarity with a, a particularly uh, particular family. Um, wonderful and interesting time, and uh, you certainly don't need to be Jewish to enjoy a, a visit and learn about a niche cultural group uh, in an area that, frankly, most people would not expect to find them. Um, it's been a real honor uh, to present these stories to you today, and I thank Kavod and, and Gabriel for setting this up and, and hosting me today. And, and uh, Thank you for the opportunity, and I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and open it up for a few minutes of uh, Q&A. And I do have a question. Hi, I'm Jane. wondering if you have any other uh, documentation of other poets or writers, especially females, that lived in Leadville during that area, era. Un unfortunately, not many. Um, as a matter of fact, the only one that I can think of off the top of my head is Ruth Ward Kahn. Um, there, there, there are some um, interesting women that had some um, pretty heavy involvement. Uh, Carrie Meyer uh, comes to mind. That might be one you want to look over. Um, she was sort of instrumental in facilitating uh, getting a, a quite a large grant from Andrew Carnegie uh, to build Leadville's first public library. Um, she is uh, a one that uh, a story that comes to mind that uh, that might be very interesting in in some of the women that were uh, uh, a little more uh, directly involved uh, with the uh, uh, founding and development of Leadville, um, and uh, she might be very interesting as far as uh, you know actual authors and and poets. We just we we. I, I'm not sure we found many of them. Like I said, uh, Ruth's probably um, really the only one um, that really sticks out there. But there, there are some interesting women's story. There was also Jenny Schoenberg who operated a, a, a sort of an apothecary a shop uh, here for uh, several decades uh, that you might also find quite interesting. Thank you. Um, and I'll just uh, ask a question that spurred from your answer. Is the Carnegie Library still standing in Leadville? 
it is still standing. It is now the Heritage Museum. Um, they built a more modern public library, I think, in the 50s or 60s. Um, so it, it, it no longer operates as a, uh, as a library, but it does still say Carnegie Library uh, on, the, on the building facade. Uh, yeah, or more of a comment. You had a picture of the May DNF in Zackendorf Hall. Uh -huh. And it said circa 1950. Uh -huh. And, and uh, I was thinking about that. And I remember the original May Company on 16th and Champer, 16th and Stout. And they, and they had these glass uh, entrance, or, or on either side was a hallway, there was a hallway with the window displays. And you know, this time of year, they used to have fabulous displays the May Company and the Denver Drive for the for the Christmas holidays, but I also I, I think you might predate me a little bit, but I, you know, as a kid yeah. in the in the 60s and 70s, I used to skate at Zeckendorf, so I remember those yeah. really yeah. grand displays. Right, and, uh, but uh, this was before Zeckendorf, because we used to go after Sunday school and go skating at Zeckendorf, oh, wow. but, uh, but, but anyways, what I was going to say was, wouldn't it be more circa 1960? Because I remember going down there when it when it first opened, you know, taking a bus, and I was only four years old in 1950. And the other reason I I ask you that is because when we were growing up, one thing we would do at the original May Company on 16th Street, you know, at Champion Stout, is, is they had these alcoves on the third or fourth floor, and they had the record players, and you could take 45 records and listen to them. And I know as a result of that, I, I bought particularly one record. It was by rock legend, Little Richard, Lucille. And I know that was a 57 record. And so, yeah. the, so, so that building, you know, the, the fancy made DNF could not have been around 1950. Yeah, and, and, and probably wasn't. Uh, you know, that's just sort of a, a random yeah. illustration. It, that may have been uh, an architectural rendering. Oh. Um, you know, before it was even built. Uh, right. So, and that's why we kind of tag things uh, like that with circa rather than giving a right. definitive date. Yeah, um, that's but it's interesting that you bring up the forty-five um, listening yeah. stations because I remember those when I was a kid too in the in the huh. in the seventies. I don't remember them at Mady and F, but I I remember them at. at uh, like independent records and yeah well they were definitely at the may company that's where yeah we that's great that's great there are a couple of antique shops uh downtown where i found some uh, uh like the old may dnf boxes and things like that and some of the the ladies handkerchiefs and stuff that they would manufacture specifically for may dnf so it's, it's kind of cool to see that stuff pop up every now and then is the old hotel still in existence in Leadville? Uh, there are still a couple of historic hotels uh, that are still here in Leadville. Um, the only one that I'm aware of, uh, of that is still operating as a hotel is, um, is the, uh, the Delaware. Um, and that is right across the street from uh, the Vendome Hotel building, which is still there. Um, it just doesn't operate as a hotel anymore. It's mostly retail on the ground floor, and I think it might even be apartments on the upper floors. Um, but uh, uh, the building, the Vendome building, um, which was also the Tabor Grand Hotel for a period of time, um, that building um, still stands uh, uh, there across the street from the Delaware Hotel. Jeff, I got a question. Um, the name Miller seems to be a significant name in Leadville. Yes. Um, do you know any, they ask for any stories that come to mind? Specific stories are, are, are a little tough. Um, in general, um, so Nathan Miller uh, was a guy who came here to mine. We don't know that he was super successful at it. The family also had a clothing store um that probably supported his mining more than the mining supported the clothing store um but he was the uh cantor for the orthodox congregation for a, a significant period off and on for about 30 years 
Um, and uh, one of his daughters, Minette, uh, was a lifetime resident of Leadville. And she died in, in uh, 1980, I think. Um, but uh, she uh, sort of our, she's sort of our matriarch. She uh, uh, is really the only, uh, you know, early uh, Jewish uh, pioneer family uh, that remained here her entire life. She worked uh, for the county welfare department uh, for quite some time, and she was also a, a school teacher. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Manette Miller um, uh, was one of Leadville's longest residents. There are a lot of people here that still remember her. Um, and uh, she and her parents are uh, actually buried down in the Hebrew Cemetery. 